Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. It is Saturday. It is the last day of September, the 30th of September, year of our Lord, 2023. I do pray this finds you well on this very warm day. Weather is going to change this week, so enjoy it. But it's uh, hot and muggy out there. So uh, anyway, we're not shoveling snow. That'll happen soon enough. Remember Bible study. 10.30 tomorrow after church, we're going through kind of a survey of the book of Genesis. No youth group tomorrow night. We had it last week. We'll have it again uh, next week. Um, we will also uh, be going very soon. Details, I think, have already been set out, but we'll send them out again. Uh, going hiking and a little bonfire at Wildcat Den State Park. So some details will be coming out regarding that. So Bible study tomorrow. Book club also on Monday, but then I'll be out of town at the pastor's conference on Tuesday and Wednesday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. And tonight, again, Returning to the daily lectionary, and I missed last night because it was at, a, at my one of my cousins died, a uh, man I was very close to growing up. Uh, there was a group of us, uh, cousins, six of us all together, but we were very close growing up, spent a lot of time together. So he uh, he died, so I went to the visitation last night in Chicago. I um, couldn't be there today for the, for the uh, funeral, but I will pray for the family of my cousin Frank later, as I have been doing over the last several days. So tonight we turn to the Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, picking up uh, in the Sermon of the Mount, chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they are, will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive other their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And this is the Gospel of the Lord. And remember, in the Sermon on the Mount, the first thing we remember is we come into it hearing that first of the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is. Remember I talked a couple nights ago, I talked about the grammar. Uh, we are blessed, present tense, it's indicative meaning this is where, where we're at now. And not ours is the kingdom of heaven. Now this is all the lens, the doorway we walk into the sermon. It all has to do with Christ. This is what you are because of Christ. As God's people, this is what you are. We heard about being the salt and the light. And now he goes on to talk about you know, sort of unpacking the law and making sure we understand it as the gift that it is and to understand it correctly. So tonight we hear about the practice of prayer and things like that, devotion, our devotional life. So he says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people. Now, now there's nothing wrong with practicing the righteousness of God. You know, how do we learn what is righteous and what is wicked? What is good and what is evil? Uh, well, it's, you know, it is written on the universe. It's written in our hearts. And that's a discussion, though, for another day. 
but it's an important thing in evangelism and apologetics, understanding that fact. But um, the the commandments, you know, are are woven into the fabric of creation, woven into our hearts, and we know that they're good. And so we do them. You know, as Christians, we 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 want to uphold them. So it is God who determines what is righteous and what is not righteous. And, and you know, it's kind of obvious when we look too. I mean, without you know, this, this is where natural law comes in, because I know that. If my action is hurting somebody else, I can call it what I want. I can call it loving and stuff like that, but but it's not. You know, not, you know there's sometimes tough love, and that's you know parents engage in that all the time. But I'm talking about you know things we do with each other's bodies and things like that, uh, and we actually are hurting them. We're hurting their body, and calling it loving, and that, that's not. You know, so we 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 know. Okay, this isn't love when it's selfish. You know. True love, God's love, is selfless. It looks to the needs of the neighbor. So anyway, there's nothing wrong with practicing righteousness, for looking at the commands and, and doing that, and saying, yes, these are good things. Now, notice what Christ says here, though. There's nothing wrong with even doing that before other people. Things have to be done or are often done in public. But the reason is this, in order to be seen by them, are you doing these things because you love God and therefore you love your neighbor and you're serving God as you serve your neighbor? Or are you looking for the accolades of your community? We're very kind of touchy about this in the church. I know I am as a pastor about putting names on things and stuff like that, where to draw that line. It's hard to know sometimes. But it, it, my, and kind of what I sense, too, is sometimes people, it doesn't happen very often, but but people come to me and want their name on something. They're going to give, you know, pay for something that's usually quite expensive. And they want their name on it by really way of advertisement in order to be seen by others. And then my answer is no. Sometimes it gets a little tense. No, but... Sometimes honoring the life of a saint in the congregation, and we, we that's okay. That's okay. The key here is order to be seen. What's the goal of your heart? Are you doing this to get the approval of others? Or are you doing this because this is what God would have you do? Okay? So uh, he says, okay, you know, you're not going to have a reward if you're doing it for others. We do this because we love God. If you're doing it to earn something from others, you know, there's no reward from God. You're trying to get it from them. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, we are rewarded in heaven for our works, but we're saved because of Christ. And we won't care if, if somebody gets more than you because they did more good works. Um, and no one's going to care about that because we'll, we'll be perfectly reconciled to each other uh, and holy without the stain of sin. So no jealousy or anything like that. We'll rejoice in what other, people's, other people were able to do and maybe we weren't. So also, same thing, when you give to the needy, same thing. Uh, and he uses the word hypocrites. Uh, hypocrite is the Greek word, the ancient Greek word for actor. Somebody who pretends, we, we understand the same meaning, somebody who pretends to be well, something they're not. So he says, okay, if you're giving to the needy, don't. You, you, why are you doing it? You know, you, you don't need to sound a trumpet, don't need to tell people in the streets. Humble bragging, you know, that's the, I, that, I just heard that term a couple of years ago for the first time, and I can't remember the man, he, he died kind of unexpectedly young guy, the guy who coined that term, it's a relatively new term, humble bragging. But it's like, you know, oh yeah, 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 I, 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 I am, uh, you know, I am giving up myself. Yeah, you've heard it, you know, somebody who's, who's feigning humility, but actually bragging. So same thing here. Uh, we do, we serve our neighbor, we give to the needy, you know, out of love for God and realizing that they are you know, created in the image of God and fellow uh, people redeemed by Christ, whether they realize it or not. And the whole idea is not to get the reward from, from our fellow people. You know, and think about that. Think about all the things you do that, that no one will ever know. Little things. And, you know, sometimes that temptation is there. Boy, sure, temptation is there. I sure wish people knew about it. But, you know, you push that aside as God's people. It's like, it, it doesn't matter if, if nobody knows about it. God knows, and I'm serving God as I serve my neighbor. You know, what else do I need? What else do I need? And now, finally, he goes on to talk about prayer. Okay, so don't be like, here's the word hypocrites again. You know, now, there's nothing wrong. Somebody wants to ask me, and it was a good question about, okay, when, um, when Jesus says, don't do it in the synagogues and the street corners, that, that, and again, here it is, that they may be seen by others. So somebody asked me, you know, does that mean we shouldn't, you know, is corporate prayer in church wrong? No, in fact, there is strong admonitions as the command of God that we come together as people and pray. Uh, that the Old Testament, New Testament, they gathered here at the book of Acts, they gathered for the prayers. They come together for corporate prayer. 
So it's not, you know, God is, our Lord Jesus Christ here is not saying, you know, you can't pray in church because that, you know, that, that everyone can see that. No, there's absolutely nothing wrong. In fact, we are commanded to come together corporately and pray, come together as a group and pray. So he says, again, the goal here is, is that you may be seen by others. Now, people can see us praying. You know, that's fine. Anybody can come to our service, and you know, the service is posted online, as many churches are, and they can see us praying. That's fine. But uh, uh, the goal is to, because of Christ, to know that God hears us and to pray for our neighbors around us, regardless of who's watching or who isn't watching. God hears you when you're in secret, and you are heard not because of your many words, not because of your station in life, you know, I'm not heard because I'm a pastor. I'm heard because of Christ. Now, as a pastor, I have a job to intercede as Christ for the congregation. I pray to Christ or through Christ. And, the, and because of Christ, not because of me, because of Christ, God promises to hear. Wonderful tool we have as Christians, knowing that and it's, it's one of the most important things that God has given us. Pray. So many things in the world I don't know to do anything about. So I pray. And it's not, it's not the words. You know, the, sometimes my prayers are, Lord, have mercy. I don't know what else to pray. You see an ambulance go by, Lord, have mercy. What I don't know anything about the situation, the people inside. I don't know what to pray for specifically. It's okay. It's not like God puts that requirement on you. It helps us to pray for things specifically and use names because like it keeps it in our mind. Who we're praying for, and it keeps us in it. It keeps us. It, it keeps it in our mind that maybe we can help them. You know, if they're local. Uh, maybe there's something I can do to help them. So yes, you know, I'm not saying don't pray in names, but do you think God doesn't know their name? The Almighty. If the God need, if our God needs you to remind them, to remind Him of of somebody's name, we need a new God because He's pretty weak. Then, right? So you get the point. So Jesus again says, "Why are you doing this? We're doing this because we're commanded to do it, and we know because of Christ, He hears us." He says, you don't have to worry about heaping up empty phrases you're not heard because of your eloquence. I fumble for words all the time, as you hear sometimes when I'm doing this, when I pray. So you're not heard from your, for your many words, you're heard because of Christ. So he says, this is how you pray. And he gives us the Lord's Prayer. And when you say this one, Luke's is slightly different. But what Jesus is giving us, and this very quickly became words that we say in the church, but it's also meant as a structure to hang other prayers on. You know, he's saying this is the structure of Christian prayer, uh, not you know just pray this and you're done. And think about that while you're praying it. Uh, and I'll tell you this too: if the if the prayer becomes rote, that can happen. Connection, you know, because we say it so often. Open up your catechism. If you need a catechism, let me know. I'll give you one. I'll just you know I'll just give it to you. Um, and read the explanation of the Lord's Prayer. It goes through all the petitions, and it, you, know, you can go to the back of the Catechism and see all, see all the scriptural passages that show where, you know, how that's all supported, what our Lord is teaching us from Scripture, and what we're actually praying for. And it's very helpful, you know, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But most of the time we say it like this. So just remember, if it's rote, you're just kind of breezing through it. Remember, just it's okay to, to pause. It's meant that it's meant to be the structure, the framework on which we hang our prayers. So we and think about how it starts, much much like how the Beatitudes began with, with uh, "Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is our Father." First thing we get to say, we get to call. I'm quoting Luther here. We get to call upon the Almighty Father, the Almighty God, as a dear child approaches their dear Father. All right, our Father. And this, again, is because of Jesus Christ. He brings us into, wherever he is, there is the kingdom of heaven. He brings us into the presence of his Father through his blood. And we can stand there without fear, knowing that because of Christ, because of Christ, we are heard. And that's what that Our Father indicates. I mean, it is a collective prayer. All the Christians pray this, right? But Jesus is saying, you're praying this with me because I'm bringing you into the presence of the Father and you're heard because of me. Our Father. And then we hear, you know, Hallowed be your name. You know, we say, Our Father who art in heaven, uh, hallowed be thy name. Uh, art means who is, reside, resides in heaven. Hallowed means holy. Sometimes, you know, especially kids, when they're learning this, what, is, what does that mean? Because we don't use that language anymore. I like the old language, and you, you learn it very quickly. By the time you're 10 years old, you got it down, what all the words mean. Um, you know, everything else is fairly easy, but hallowed means to keep holy his name. And how the many ways we do that and, and how he teaches us to do that. His kingdoms 
coming. And think about that. His kingdom is coming whether we, we don't make it come. You know, Christ just Christ doesn't come when we he finally gets enough people on earth to ask him to come. This is the plan of God from the fullness of salvation. He just comes. And he says, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, he, he's on the scene. He's doing things to show it's all here now. Same thing, he comes to you. So his kingdom, when he brings the kingdom with you, his kingdom is coming, whether you pray or not. But when we pray these things, we're, we're saying, okay, what does that mean? What does it mean to have his kingdom come? Uh, and, and, and what does that mean for a prayer life and the needs of our neighbor? Same thing uh, with uh, give us this day our daily bread, uh, forgive us our trespasses, and that's conditional, as our Lord says here. He says, forgive us our trespasses as we are debts, um, as we forgive those who, who have incurred debt against us. Forgive, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Notice that wording. It's pretty cool. Um, it's also a little bit of a warning. So he says, you forgive others their trespasses. Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father forgive you. Remember, all this flows from what we are in Christ. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, poor in spirit. Remember, I talked about that poor in spirit is realizing what you are as you stand before God. It's like, yeah. Not holy. It doesn't mean you're not a good person. You go out and live your life as a Christian. But it means that you know your heart. You know the darkness that re resides there. And apart from the influence of Christ in our lives, what we're capable of. And it's not good. And that doesn't go away until we die. You know, we learn how to, to, to keep pushing it down, pushing it down. Um, so anyway, we're forgiven so much. And he says, and you're going to forgive like you're forgiven. And if you're not going to forgive like you're forgiven, then don't you expect to be forgiven. Forgive, forgiven. So uh, wonderful. This is how we pray, you know. And we're not you know, to give you the overture. Remember, this is the Sermon on the Mount, and and we're we're re required to pray. God asks us to pray. It's the, it's a powerful tool. Trust me. It seems like words, but remember, Christ. When God invites you to do something, there's a promise and a power attached to it. His promises because of Christ to hear you and then act. And then act according to his good and gracious will. Thy will be done. You know, but he will act. So pray like we're doing tonight, corporately and then privately. Before you go to bed, I'll pray again before I go to bed, just privately. Pray first thing in the morning when I get up, just privately, 15 minutes. Sometimes a little bit longer. And, and again, maybe I don't have to rush up right away, but get yourself in the habit of it. Maybe set the alarm for 10, 15 minutes earlier. Or if you have to get the kids out and everything like that, have like 10, 15 minutes to have a cup of coffee and just sit there and, you know, open up Treasury of Daily Prayer or at the hymnal, and look at the, the readings for the day, and pray. You know, pay attention to what's going on in the news and the community throughout the world, not, not just to dwell in, in, in how to guide your prayers. My prayers are for, you know, peace in our communities, peace throughout the world, good leaders, and we go through them throughout the week. Um, we, there, it's structured, kind of rotating, rotating, rotating throughout the week. But anyway, learn what your neighbors need, too. And you see something going on with your neighbor, um, uh, or they share something with you, pray. And pray with them on the spot if you can. You know, you'll fumble for words. Remember, you're not heard because of your eloquence. You're heard because of Christ. And you can remind people of that, too, when you're praying. And all that flow is from Christ coming to us in the divine service. That's the last thing I'm going to say about this. We're starting at 9.18. And you can hear my voice is getting kind of gravelly. So let's confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for faithfulness until the very end. We pray for the renewal of those who are withering in the faith or have fallen away. 
for receptive hearts and minds to God's word as we will gather tomorrow on the Lord's day. And for my brothers in office, fellow pastors, and, and the people as we prepare and the people prepare to gather to administer and receive Christ's holy gifts. May we be well prepared tomorrow morning, realizing who we are as we stand before you and what you've come to us to bring, forgiveness and the promise of everlasting life. We ask you to bless those who are traveling with safe travel, allow them to reach their destination safely, send favorable weather, particularly as the harvest has now begun. We ask you to be with those who are crying out for healing, Wayne, Myron, Dennis, Dave, Don, Ardo, Klaus, Luray, Cecil, Fern, Joan, Chris, Karen, Jeremy, Marlis, Anita, Dave, Dylan, Jeff, Christy, Brad, Paul, Clint, Beth, Lori, Don, Liberty, Joe, Phil, Katie, Josiah, Bob, Jim, Tom, Eric, Chris, Sue, Tim, Ron, Bert, Heather, D, John, Jason, Camden, Ashley, Scott, Amy, Don, and all who cry out to you. Place your healing hand upon them as they cry out to you. Heal them according to your gracious will, keeping them ever mindful of your victory over death itself. Heavenly Father, we pray for the family of my cousin uh, and uh, childhood mentor, uh, Frank, as uh, he was laid to rest this day. Pray that you'd bless his family with your peace as they look forward to a joyful reunion before your throne with all those who have gone before us in the faith. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. Bring to your hands, I commend myself, my body, soul, all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I'm going to sing uh, stanza one of hymn 770, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. That stands a one of three of him 770. With that, my brothers and sisters, I pray the Lord grant you a blessed rest. For God's grace, we'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.